Indicates I'm going to describe to you some of the work we've been doing on antithrombotic aftermers, particularly in the context of the, the last year with the emergence of, of COVID-19. And I'm really going to tell you how we've been thinking the last year. Could you use some of these aftermers to try to combat sort of what we now all know from the media, et cetera, is uh, this hypercoagulable state uh, that we observe in uh, patients, particularly severely ill patients with COVID-19. And I'm gonna tell you how we've become interested really in two aftermers in particular for such applications. One is this aftermer we've been studying for a while now that targets factor nine, uh, but particularly its use in extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And I'll describe to you a little bit what that is coming up, uh, or ECMO. And then the second part, I'm gonna describe a second aftermer that targets von Willebrand factor. We're particularly interested in that application of acute ischemic stroke, which unfortunately is also uh, increased in COVID uh, infected individuals. As a disclosure, the aftermath of our Wilbur factory actually have spun out of Duke and licensed to a company, Basking Bio, where uh, I'm a founder and equity holder. So, anyway, why do we get particularly interested in these two aftermaths and targeting these two factors? Well, we set out again, starting about nine months to a year ago now, uh, collecting samples from severely ill. COVID-19 patients in our ICU at Duke University. Uh, we evaluated 56 of them uh, over multiple time points uh, longitudinally. Unfortunately, even though these patients are being treated with prophylactic anticoagulation, so low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, 25% of them still have major thrombotic events in the ICU. Um, moreover, unfortunately, 16% are also hemorrhage that's the challenge with anticoagulation often as you're walking this two-edged sword and uh, even more unfortunate, 23% of them have, have passed away. Uh, and it turns out the patients that have these thromboembolic events in the ICU, uh, it, uh, when we look at the coagulation factors in particular, two of them jumped out to us as being particularly elevated, von Willebrand factor and factor eight. So obviously we became interested in, in von Willebrand factor because it's upregulated in these patients. And it turned, we also became interested in factor nine because it's shown here, and it's actually the partner of factor eight when they're activated to make active factor 10 A's, which then cleaves thr prothrombin to thrombin. And actually the after we had to factor nine, the mechanism is that it blocks sort of this interaction between nine A and eight A. So in a sense, it's also an eight A type of inhibitor. And what's also interesting is actually potentially part of the reason that eight is, act, is up regulated in these patients is that it's actually carried in circulation by von Willebrand factor. And it could be just because you're getting more VWF, it's also driving more factor eight into uh, blood. And I'm just gonna show you one piece of data. Uh, other people have also reported similar things now, many groups saying these things, but here's just an example of what we're seeing, looking at von Willebrand factor levels in these type of patients. So we're comparing it importantly to matched controls that are non-COVID patients. So again, similar BMI, similar comorbidities. Uh, these are the normal von Willebrand factor levels in these individuals. If you look at the people who either survive or, or are deceased, you see a significant, you know, almost quadrupling or more in the deceased case levels of von Willebrand factor in circulation. And that's regardless of whether they're on ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation as shown here. Uh, more where you see this trend, the higher levels, the worse you are actually significantly uh, increased in the patients who, who deceased versus survive. So having large amounts of von Willebrand factor uh, is detrimental in these patients. And conversely, it's interesting, the, the enzyme that cuts von Willebrand factor, Adam TS13, from larger multimers to shorter ones is decreased in these patients. So not only are you generating more von Willebrand factor, it tends to be longer, which is again, more prothrombotic. So for this reason as shown here, and I, I could show you similar data with factor nine, I mean, factor eight, we became interested in t thinking about could, you know, the afternoons we had made to factor nine and von Willebrand factor particularly be, potentially be useful in this setting. So what um, we began to think about in at least the most severely ill individuals who have COVID that when their pulmonary function is, you know, basically they're unable to um, support um, oxygenation of their blood through their own lungs, 
what they're what's done is they're putting on put on what's called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation to oxygenate again their blood and you use basically a machine like this where you circulate the blood through an oxygenator membrane to get oxygenate them because they're unable to do it themselves. So of the 56 papers we patients we were studying, nine of them unfortunately became very, very ill and required this type of life support uh, and were put on uh, ECMO. Uh, unfortunately, even in this subset, actually these problems are even worse. So 78% of them had major thrombosis, again, despite anticoagulation now with large amounts of heparin. So again, it's just not good enough. But moreover, because you're giving them heparin, which is a very blunt anticoagulate, 78% of them have major bleeding as well. And again, 22% of them passed away. So there's a lot of interest in trying to improve anticoagulation in the setting of ECMO because of these reasons, particularly in COVID where it's even worse than non-COVID patients. And there's been a lot of interest in targeting the so-called contact pathway uh, of blood clotting, which is activation of factor 12 to 12A, which activates 11 to 11A, which ultimately activates factor nine to 9A. And the reason why there's a lot of interest in targeting this pathway here is because it's known that this pathway is activated when blood contacts sort of artificial surfaces such as the tubing or the membrane uh, in the circuit because there's not endothelial cells uh, reducing this activation or limiting it uh, when it goes to the circuit. So we got interested to say, and other people have been interested in targeting this pathway, so we, we knew we had this after a factor 9A and asked, could you use it to maintain this type of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? So we went on and actually started collaborating with two of our surgical colleagues at Duke. Uh, Lisa Tracy who is one of the vascular surgeons at Duke and Chris Reed, who's one of the surgical residents. And then Charlene, an excellent grad student in the lab worked with them on this project as along with Jim Fredrickson and Julie Laser. So we took our factor nine after which is shown here uh, it's actually pegylated, it's fully modified. There's only one hydroxyl left uh, in, in this RNA. Um, it's all two prime methyl and two prime fluoro. Besides that, uh, as many of you know from hearing me talk before, you can make an antidote oligo to this, which base pairs with this red part, but I'm not gonna have time to talk about that today. But it is one, I think, unique advantage of aptamers, as, as Naboisha mentioned earlier. So our question was, could you use this aptamer to support ECMO? So we decided to test this in a pig model. Again, the aptamer is called DTRI-178. It's basically the same aptamer that Regato we licensed to before that some of you may have followed called RB006. Um, and so we took pigs, baby pigs basically, or piglets, and we subject them to ECMO for 12 hours, again, where we would circulate their blood outside of, of the body. It's a VA type of ECMO. Um, and we compared side by side two pigs, one where we gave heparin to them and the uh, pig next to it were given the aptamer and then we did five and five animals. So the data I'll show you is from groups of five. And so first we wanted to ask, could you just keep the blood flowing, the circuit patent? Again, if you don't anticoagulate, you know, it all clots off quickly because you have this activation of, of, of clotting. Unfortunately, by the way, we wish we could do this in a pig model where you can infect with COVID, but there's no porcine COVID model currently. So this is a non-infected pigs, but, but the data basically are shown here that you can keep the blood flow constant over the 12 hour window with a single bolus administration of the aptamer. I give it at uh, 0.5 mg per kg. And for heparin, we dose them how you would do it clinically. You give them a bolus dose and then you monitor anticoagulation of the, the animal. And then you give a continuous infusion after that because the half-life of heparin is 45 to 90 minutes. So you gotta keep monitoring it, which is actually part of the problem with using heparin in, uh, in this type of system where you may put people on ECMO now for weeks uh, in, the, in the COVID uh, setting. Similarly, if you look for, you know, are you maintaining correct pressure across the oxygenator membrane? You could see that in all 10 of the animals, you were well within the normal range. So you weren't building up excess pressure across the membrane. And again, that was borne out when you looked directly at the, at the uh, membranes, which again, uh, oxygenator membranes, which are one of the main procoagulant surfaces. When you visually inspect them, you saw very minimal clot either with heparin or with the aptamer drug. And similarly, when you even look microscopically, so this is scanning EMs uh, of the membrane, you could see very minimal uh, clot forming on even at, at microscopic levels in either the group that had heparin or the aptamer. So the aptamer could apparently replace 
heparin in this uh, setting and, and limit uh, clotting and activation thrombosis. So what about this other issue of bleeding, which is a major problem again with heparin in the setting and you see it in the animals as well. So so on the top two panels of this slide is what you see after 12 hours of running ECMO, uh, when you give heparin as anticoagulant, unfortunately you have continual sort of slow bleeding from the access site. So here's the head of the animal, and here's the tail of the animal for the two access areas. And you can contrast that to the animals who receive the aptamer at the bottom, you can see much less uh, bleeding probably because the aptamer is effective at blocking clotting, but it's a much more specific targeted inhibitor. It's not a blunt instrument like heparin, which is largely inhibiting thrombin once it's generated. So a couple things happen here. You're kind of stopping the horse, you know, when it's out of the barn in the case of heparin versus targeting upstream. The other thing is that you don't inhibit thrombin generation uh, with heparin. You basically inhibit it once it's made. So you consume your clotting factors, which is part of the problem why you bleed. And when you measure sort of blood loss and the amount of transfusion you need in these animals, you could see it required significant transfusion uh, uh, in the heparin treated animals and much, much less uh, in the guys that receive the aptern. Again, this is consistent with what we see clinically that these people given heparin tend to bleed. Went on to ask, well, could the aptern also work in um, samples from these COVID-19 patients uh, that were on ECMO and again, this is just looking at a clotting, a clotting of whole blood in an ACT type time. Shown on the left is just control healthy volunteers, but the important patients are shown here on the right, where we had three patients that were on ECMO. It turns out one, two of them were actually on heparin. This person had been taken off of heparin because they started to bleed, which happens again, and they probably consumed a lot of their clotting factors. But again, in all three of these patients' blood, you could dose in the afternoon at equivalent dose and significantly prolong the clotting indicating at least the after was effective, at least in their blood uh, ex vivo. So, uh, and I should point out the people who helped us uh, um, set up and procure all these samples, particularly Lyra and Janu were uh, with Brian Kraft in our ICU were, were critical in, the, in getting us access to these patient samples. So this was all we can do, at least the after looked active also in these COVID samples. Uh, for the last, a uh, few slides in a couple minutes. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a second after targeting von Willebrand factor and how we've been interested in stroke, uh, potentially treating with this after, but also furthermore, talk about how stroke has become important again in the setting of COVID. So we became interested in targeting BWF for um, ischemic stroke now a couple of years ago. And the reason why was there was um, studies coming out, such as the one highlighted here on the left, that when people would examine clots that they would remove for people's brains uh, by thrombectomy following uh, a large vessel occlusion, uh, what they would see is that the clot had sort of the following structure, have a core, it's sort of, it's hard to see outlined here, but this is a very fiber rich core. But then outside of the core, what would occlude the vessel would actually be a loosely packed group of platelets that were held together by von Willebrand factor. And so we thought to say, thought, well, if we could basically disrupt um, sort of this loose packing by targeting BWF, we may actually be able to inhibit this occlusive thrombosis, but also maybe even uh, sort of break up because these are held together loosely, uh, such a clots. And so uh, with that in mind, we got interested in stroke. And so the other, we became particularly even more interested in the case of, of COVID-19 for sort of the following reason, and that is, the patients would start to show up in the emergency room having a stroke and it may be their first symptom of COVID. They may not know they have COVID otherwise with a stroke. And then um, you would go in and you would say, okay, this patient, for example, here a stroke, has a stroke. You go in and you image where the blockage is and here they're doing by radiography. They see it's a large vessel occlusion uh, into the brain. So you're not getting perfusion into the brain. And our collaborator is actually a patient of his uh, Dr. Nimji at Ohio State as a neurovascular surgeon would go in and remove this clot, which is this type of clot now, and uh, allow for reperfusion of the brain as shown here. The problem is that only about 15% of patients receive this type of therapy. The vast majority don't. And in the case of COVID, what I'm not showing here is that, that Dr. Nimji and others have shown you remove this clot and then you get good reperfusion, but then eventually you'll get distal, you know, additional clots in these peripheral arteries that you can't access by surgical methods. So again, um, 
uh, mechanisms to control stroke in these patients are, are particularly important. And he went on to show similarly, particularly these patients who have stroke, the von Willebrand factor is, is very elevated. So we got interested in, in testing this aftermer shown here on the right, this aftermer von Willebrand factor again binds very well. So low single digit nanomolar, it's totally modified with two prime methyls and two prime fluoros as shown here. We built this little tail on the end of it to make an antidote oligo that could pair with it and reverse it. And again, I'm not gonna have time to show you all of that data, but you can rapidly reverse this as well. The people in the lab who've worked on this over the years are Sabah, Julie, and George. And we, again, worked long time with our collaborator, uh, Dr. Nimji at Ohio State, and then Rick Becker, who's really an expert at University of Cincinnati in developing antiplatelet uh, type of agents clinically. So we wanted to ask, could you use this uh, to inhibit uh, von Willebrand factor and potentially as an antithrombotic or even a, a molecule that could revascularize or recanalize um, occluded vessels. And we've looked at this in five different animals, six different animal models now. Uh, I'm not going to have time to show you them all, but I'm, because I'm focusing on stroke, I'm really going to focus on the, the last two models, which is a thromboembolic stroke model in mice and then a carotid artery recanalization model in dogs. So in the mouse stroke model, this again was work done by our collaborator at Ohio State. Uh, what's done is they put a catheter up into the middle cerebral artery, put a clot in the syringe and then inject it into the brain of a mouse. And then they wait for an hour and then they'll treat with either control aftermer or the wild type after again, in this case, uh, one mig per kg or again, um, TPA in this case. And then they'll measure the next day what the stroke volume in the brain is by MRI. And what you can see is if you don't give anything or a control afterward, you see a large stroke volume, the opaque part of the brain here where it's dead now. Um, and you can see that, you know, this is significant on one hemisphere of the, of the mouse. You can see you can significantly reduce this as shown here uh, by giving the afterward even an hour post injecting that clot in the brain, showing that you're helping recanalize or revascularize uh, the brain in the face of that clot. Now I'm not showing TPA here as a control and the reason why if you give TPA in this model all the mice die because of hemorrhage. Um, so again we don't see that, we don't see the bleeding issue. It could be because we're not impacting that fibrin core which again TPA does and may cause increased bleeding. We're not sure that's one hypothesis but again the BWF after in this type of model appears, appears to be not only effective but, but, but safer than TPA. Similarly, in a dog model, so this is a dog model where we're damaging the carotid artery. So that's shown here. So here we're exposing the carotid artery of a dog. And this is looking at blood flow by radiography, which is something you do in a dog, unfortunately you can't do in a mouse. Um, and you can see blood flow through here. You damage this by a chemical insult and you can see blood flow stops. So now you're not getting blood flow to this distal part of the vessel. And again, this thing here is actually a flow probe that lets you monitor blood flow in real time. And then what would happen in these dogs is you would treat them with, again, one mg per kg of the aftermer, and it turns out five of the eight aftermer, uh, uh, dogs treated with the aftermer, you could get recanalization and restore blood flow through the carotid. And then when you looked at the vessels in these dogs, you could see the vessel was open. Here's the damaged vessel. Here's the counterlateral vessel on the other side of the, the dog. You could see where there's no damage. So again, this indicated the aftermer could open up uh, this occluded vessel, even though it had been occluded for 45 minutes in this particular case. We're extending all these things, I would say, out to longer time points. Now we're doing the ischemic, uh, the thrombobolic stroke model in the dog out to six hours to see how long uh, this beneficial effect can be extended to. Note in these type of models, again, TPA is not very effective. It maybe partially does something in the clot, but it isn't able to really fully restore blood flow. That's very consistent with what we see clinically. Only about 10% of people have any benefit for receiving TPA. And again, control guys, you don't see reopening of the vessel. You can see large clots here. So conclusions, again, I know we're out of time, is that um, we've been able to determine that this factor nine aftermer DTR 178 can effectively support ECMO at least for up to 12 hours in a swine model and reduce bleeding uh, compared to standard of care heparin, uh, but control thrombosis effectively as heparin. Um, moreover, as I recently as I just showed you, this VWF aftermer looks interesting for treating or reducing extreme stroke uh, volume. So the the stroke volume you see in a, in a 
the brain of a, of a mouse. And again, right now we're extending that in the dogs uh, currently. And it also can block throat, um, uh, the carotid artery. Uh, re it can also induce carotid artery recanalization as I showed you in dogs. And moreover, I didn't show this because of time, but both of these can be rapidly reversed with antidote oligos, which again, we think is a differentiator. It's particularly important in stroke because bleeding in the brain is very bad. Uh, and I, finally, by studying COVID-19 coagulopathies, we think that these targets are particularly interested because they're significantly elevated in these patients and pretend poor outcomes. And finally, just like to acknowledge uh, the group, here's the COVID thrombosis team. I mentioned Lear and Janu and Brian, who've been key uh, to, to this work. And then working with Jerry Levy, who's really an expert on anticoagulation and acute care. The ECMO group I mentioned, Lisa and Chris, as shown here. And then finally, the stroke group as shown here, and particularly underscore the work and collaboration we've been doing with uh, the NIMG group at Ohio State, and uh, um, who are really uh, vascular neurosurgeon experts. And then finally, I want to actually acknowledge and thank Larry and congratulate him. Um, he's been first a mentor and then a colleague and, and now a great friend. He's encouraged us for all this work over the years. And I can uh, honestly say I wouldn't be doing this with, without his excitement and encouragement about the Abner field and uh, selection in general. So congratulations, Larry, and thank you. Thank you.